Now, English cathedrals and their music. In the seventh of the series, Ivor Keyes talks about Durham, with recordings made in 1979 by the Cathedral Choir, conducted by Richard Lloyd, the organist and master of the choristers. A city which is set on a hill cannot be hid. Most of our cathedrals stand on low ground, for instance Salisbury in Water Meadows, Winchester in a saucer. Even Worcester, though it could be made to look as though it's on a cliff, hardly does more than overlook the Severn like the rest of the old town. But Durham, a superb view whether from the railway viaduct or from the U-shaped gorge of the River Wear, one of the grandest man-made spectacles in Christendom. A massive fortress, whether you are speaking of the cathedral or the castle, which share this hill peninsula, with the castle defying the only access which the river doesn't deny. The whole thing impregnable till the days of high explosive, and forming a unique combination of church and state in its principal task of keeping northern invaders out of England. Indeed, Durham has, or had, something in common with Salzburg, which was not Mozart and certainly not its weather. It was the seat of a powerful combination of temporal and spiritual power in the shape of one person, the bishop, a position which obtained in Durham till little more than a century ago. It would certainly have been no easier to storm the cathedral than to storm the castle, and it's significant that unlike other places near the border, Durham was never taken by the Scots. Indeed, the only large concentration of Scots Durham ever saw was the 10,000 or so which Cromwell saw fit to imprison in the cathedral after the Battle of Dunbar. Since the year 995, Durham was the shrine of the remains of St. Cuthbert when Danish raiders had made the holy island of Lindisfarne too unsafe for the monks who guarded it there. Eventually, a Norman bishop, William de St. Carilef, who began his reign in 1081, but was exiled to France by King William Rufus, began the present cathedral in 1093. It's perhaps needless to say that being a Norman, he destroyed the Saxon church to make way for it. He had doubtless had his imagination stirred by the splendid French churches then a building. His great Durham church was finished in what, considering its size and the tools, was the short time of 40 years. It has no projecting lady chapel at the east end. Instead, in the 13th century, that same Bishop de Poor, under whom Salisbury Cathedral was built, now marked his translation to Durham by initiating the building of a chapel at the east end, actually wider than the nave itself. It contains no fewer than nine altars side by side, so that the many monks could fulfill their duty of saying daily masses without too much queuing. The other notable addition to the basic cross-shaped design was at the extreme west end in about 1175 when the chapel called the Galilee was added. Probably so called, according to Archdeacon Stranx's guide, because it was a processional stopping place representing Christ's return to Galilee. In the Galilee chapel is now the tomb of the venerable Saint Bede. Bede's bones apparently came to Durham by stealth, being purloined from Jarrow by a monk named Aelfred early in the 11th century. Let's first make this vast space gently resound with the boys of the cathedral choir processing down the nave, singing an evening hymn which in all probability was sung in Durham before the Normans were ever heard of. Some have ascribed it to St Ambrose, which would make it 6th century but scholars don't accept this. But it certainly occurs in an 8th century manuscript in Germany, in the 10th century at Canterbury, and in the 11th at Durham itself. Te lucis antiterminum, to thee before the close of day, creator of the world, we pray, as thou art wont in mercy keep thy watch around us while we sleep.
we can now follow a roughly chronological order of pieces connected with the cathedral's musical history, based mainly on the list of organists. The first recorded name is John Brimley of the 16th century, who was said to be organist when the monks were still in possession, that is, before Henry VIII disbanded them. He has a charming epitaph in the Galilee Chapel. John Brimley's body here doth lie, who praised God with hand and voice. By music's heavenly harmony, dull minds he made in God rejoice. His soul into the heavens is lift, to praise him well that gave the gift. We are to hear something very modest, but fittingly homemade. A choral response to the commandments, presumably sung after each one, affording time to meditate and repent at leisure. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Nowadays, responses by a William Smith have spread from Durham to be fairly frequently heard. The organist list shows this name towards the end of the 16th century, but this is not the composer William Smith, whose anthems are in a set of choir books made when John Cousin was bishop in 1664. Cousin had been a canon of Durham from 1624 till being made master of Peterhouse, Cambridge, in 1634. At the Restoration in 1660, he was made Bishop of Durham and did much to renew the beauty of the cathedral and its music after the neglect and pillage of the Commonwealth era. For instance, we owe to him the font with its splendidly elaborated cover and the carved choir stalls. Here's William Smith's anthem, I Will Wash My Hands. It's of a type called a verse anthem, that is, featuring solo voices with some independent organ accompaniment, as well as sections for full choir. The words are from Psalm 26. An alto and bass duet begins, I will wash my hands in innocency, O Lord, and so will I go to thine altar. This latter taken up by the choir. The duet resumes, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house in which two trebles make a surprising entry as though making a roof for the house. The shapely top line is also a feature of the closing chorus and Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
The conductor, as of all the items, is the present organist Richard Lloyd, and the accompanist is Alan Thurlow, the assistant organist. Richard Lloyd now plays a fantasia for organ. It's found in Durham Cathedral Library, written out by William Smith, but probably not composed by him. The opening section is rather grave in style, like a contrapuntal anthem without words, but there's a sudden more declamatory style here picked out with brighter registration.
Perhaps it's the bracing air to add to the other delights of the place, which explains the long stays of Durham organists. But except for one short tenure, there were only four between 1710 and 1907. Fifty-three years, no less, for James Heseltine, a pupil of Blow's, forty-three for Thomas Ebden, forty-nine for William Henshaw, and forty-two for Philip Arms. Ebden's tenure was 1763 to 1811, and he has a modest place in history because in his service in sea he made musical settings of the Sanctus and Gloria, whereas for a very long period before and afterwards, other English composers set in communion music had stopped short with Kyrie and Credo, as choirs normally left, together with all the non-communicants, after the prayer for the church militant. Perhaps partly as a legacy from Bishop Cousin, Durham regularly gave choral treatment to the whole communion service. For during Ebden's organistship, a chapter minute of 1765 ordered the choir to be in attendance at the sacrament on the great festivals or otherwise on the first Sunday of each month. As an example of Ebden's tuneful work, we'll hear the beginning section of his anthem in two treble parts, Teach Me, O Lord, the Way of Thy Statutes, with its interludes for what his score calls the swelling organ. One can imagine the pleasure in innocent-sounding voices delighting in God's law that might be taken by 18th-century anthem tasters themselves hardened in sin. With Philip Arms, 
organist from 1862 to 1907. We come to the originator of Durham's music degrees in 1890 and the university's first professor of music. He was chaired in 1897. The university opened in 1833 and was largely the creation of the dean and chapter and Bishop van Mildert, who gave away his castle for the purpose. Nowadays, Arms has only one true musical memorial, but a secure one, the hymn tune called Galilee, which he wrote for the revised edition of Hymns Ancient and Modern in 1875, and which usually goes with Isaac Watts's hymn Jesus Shall Reign. In the renovation of the last verse, Richard Lloyd follows a high-spirited tradition. Durham's most famous hymn tune writer is John Bacchus Dykes, sometime presenter of the cathedral, before devoting himself, in the real sense of the word, to being a parish priest at St. Oswald's, Durham. His reputation is recovering from the blanket criticism of all things Victorian, which meant that in a hymn book called Songs of Praise, every single one of the meagre five tunes by Dykes admitted was given an alternative. Yes, even for holy, 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 and oh, come and mourn with me a while. Here, perhaps as an ear opener, is his tune Lux Vera to William Bright's words, still throned in heaven to men in unbelief 
Christ spreads his hands all day. Amongst many other things I owe Arthur Hutchings is my introduction to that tune. Durham has to thank him for his reinvigoration, I use the word deliberately, of university musical life after the war. He was professor from 1947 to 1968. We are now to hear his robust and colourful anthem written for university and civic occasions in the cathedral. Her foundations are the holy hills. As far as any hill outside the holy land can be called holy, I think Durham's can claim the title. Not only do monuments of church and state stand there, but also the university music school.
to organists, Durham also means the headquarters of the famous organ builders, Harrison's, whose splendid instrument we have just heard in full voice. To give it a solo interlude, using a wide range of dynamics and colour, here is Richard Lloyd playing Howells's Psalm Prelude, the first of his second set. This one is founded on the opening of Psalm 130, Out of the deep have I cried unto thee, O Lord. <laughs> 